You know those moments in life where you, you look around and you go, this is, this is really amazing, but, but how did I actually get here? Well, in March this year, I found myself in Southeast Asia with three Americans, and we were teaching 38 people to communicate without speaking and without being able to see. And we're also teaching these people how to swim whilst completely blinded. Now, there was nothing wrong with the vision on these people, and they could speak as well as I can speak standing here, probably a little bit better. But I'll tell you more about that later. First, what I'd like to show you is what's up on the screen. This is a PNM2 landmine. It's one of the hundreds of different types of landmines scattered throughout Southeast Asia. It's Eastern Bloc manufactured, weighs about 400 grams, and contains about 100 grams of high explosives. Predominantly plastic and nylon in construction. Now, this thing takes about five kilograms of pressure on the top plate to set it off. And it has a blast radius of about five metres. So if it's five metres over there and it goes off, it's going to do me some damage. The thing with this thing is, it's a perfect soldier. It never needs sleep. It never needs to be fed. It never needs time off. And it never complains. It just sits in the ground waiting for its intended target. Now, I'd like to share with you a saying that I heard many years ago. And I'd like you to think about that saying just for a couple of seconds. One mine, one life. Now, if you take nothing else away from my presentation here today, I'd like it to be that you remember that saying, one mine, one life. The saying comes from humanitarian mine action groups because they know for a fact that by removing one landmine from the ground, you save one life. Walking a landmine, you most likely lose your legs. Walking a big landmine, you'll lose both your legs. You get something like a PMN, you'll probably lose your genitals, might lose your eyes. A smaller one, you'll lose your foot. You get onto a cluster bomb, probably blow your hand off, blind you. Lots of people with no hands and uh, no eyes, courtesy of cluster bombs. In the year 2000, Bill Clinton was the first US president to visit Vietnam since the end of the Vietnam War. And as a goodwill gesture, he released the American bombing data from the Vietnam War. Now, what this data showed was that during the Vietnam conflict, the US dropped a combined total of 11 million tonnes of bombs on Vietnam, Cambodia and Lao PDR. Now, just think about that for a second. 11 million tonnes, that equates to 11 billion kilograms, which is just massive. Now, these bombs were designed to do one specific job, and that is to kill, maim and injure their targets. Unfortunately, almost 50 years later, they're still doing this. And to give you an idea of the impact of this, since 1979, there has been 221,000 people killed or injured from explosive remnants of war just in those three countries alone. It's a legacy issue. Who decides that a 20-something-year-old woman in the year, you know, 2012, should be blown up by something that was fired in the 1970s? In Quang Tri province, you know, there's been more than 5,000 accidents since 1975. And 30% of those are children. Kids in affected areas were not alive when the fighting took place. Yet they're still the victims. Because this issue is so large, I'm just going to speak to you specifically about Cambodia today. Now, Cambodia isn't a very large country. You could fit about 42 Cambodias into Australia. Population's about uh, 14 million people, or just over 14 million people. Current estimates have it that there's over 6 million landmines 
in the ground in Cambodia at this point in time. So that's one landmine for almost every two people in the country. Now, when Bill Clinton released this bombing data, it showed that the US covertly dropped 2.7 million tonnes of bombs on Cambodia during the Vietnam War. And you might think, well, is that a lot or isn't it? Well, 2.7 million tonnes of bombs is more than the US dropped in the entire Second World War. So it's, it's absolutely massive. Now, that's just the bombs that the US dropped. If you have a look at the red up there, that's the area where the bombing data came in from the US. This, of course, doesn't take into account all the military munitions that the Khmer Rouge used, the Royal Cambodian Armed Forces used, the North Vietnamese Army and, and the Viet Cong that also didn't go off. Now, of these bombs that they dropped, the estimated dud rate was anywhere from 10 to 30 per cent. So conservatively, you've got 300,000 tonnes to 800,000 tonnes of bombs that were dropped that didn't go off, that are still in the ground or on the ground in Cambodia. And this is on top of the landmines. So there's an awful lot. Current day perspective, since 1979, there's been 65,000 people killed or injured from explosive remnants of war in Cambodia alone. 40,000 people live as amputees, which is one of the highest rates in the world. Now, in 2008, I completed my bomb technician course with the West Australian Police. Prior to completing the course, I'd seen a, uh, a doco on the uh, Australian story on the ABC, and it was about a group called the Vietnam Veterans Mine Clearing Team. And they were in Cambodia assisting the Cambodians self help the miners to remove landmines and unexploded bombs from the ground. Now, they're doing this via providing uh, technical knowledge and supplying equipment and funds they'd raised here in Australia. And I was quite inspired by this and I thought, well, I, I would like to assist. And at that particular point in time, the Australian Federal Government, uh, as part of their National Counterterrorism Plan, had supplied us with a lot of new equipment. So all of our older equipment was earmarked to be destroyed. And a lot of this equipment was re really, really in good nick. I mean, some of it had only been used a few times. So I thought, well, why can't we donate that to them? So I contacted the Vietnam Veterans Mine Clearing Team and, and I travelled to Cambodia to see how we could assist. Travelled around the minefields and had a look around the country. This was my first trip to Cambodia and it had a massive impact on me. Everywhere you go, you can see the effects of landmines and unexploded bombs. Everybody you speak to knows somebody that's been affected in some way. So upon my return to Australia, I set about writing letters to people to try and raise more equipment than, than the stuff we already had. And long story short, myself and a couple of other officers went back to Cambodia and we took over a large amount of demining equipment. We took over trauma kits and we took over some money that I had raised through fundraising. Now, the Cambodian self-help deminers aren't just a demining group. They also established the Landmine Relief Orphanage which is to look after kids that have been affected by landmines or unexploded bombs. They provide shelter, care, education, and they strive to give these kids the ability to go on their own way and make it as adults once they get to that age. In 2011, I was invited to the 11th Meeting of States Party, which is run by the International Campaign to Ban Landmines. The ICBL is a is a treaty that's set up and has 161 signatory nations from around the world. And the treaty is that these countries agree not to manufacture, stockpile or utilise landmines. Now, whilst I was at that meeting, it, it really inspired me. I, I saw a lot of different non-government organisations or NGOs that were doing a lot of different work, not just the mining work, but a lot of work that surrounds that. And I decided I wanted to do more than I was doing. So I came up with the idea of filming a documentary and look, documentaries have been made on demining before and I thought, well, I want, to, I want to take a holistic approach. I want to show not just the demining, not just how the problem came to be, but all these other good things, things like risk education out in the village, you know, uh, microcredit schemes where people are loan money, small amounts of money, and they don't have to repay that money for two years and it's interest free. So they can go out and buy, you know, a, a cow or a pig or whatever and, and breed that and then get the money back from that and repay the loan. I also wanted to show how a lot of these victims have, have triumphed over adversity. 
Now, the young lady you see up there on the screen at the moment is named Hong Seep. Now, Hong Seep was six years of age when her friend stood on a landmine. Unfortunately for Hong Seep, she was standing next to her friend. When the landmine went off, it killed her friend instantly, and she lost her left leg. Now, if you can imagine being a child, six years of age, losing your left leg, there's not just a lot of physical pain that goes with that injury, there's a lot of psychological pain that goes with that as well. Given that Cambodia doesn't have the, the medical facilities or the mental health facilities that Australia does, there was no assistance for her at all. But regardless of that, Hong Si has triumphed over adversity. She was the first student from the Landmine Relief Fund orphanage to be accepted into university, and she's now studying a double degree in accounting and teaching. And her aim in life is to assist the disabled because she knows the suffering they go through. Okay, this is a US made Mark 84 general purpose bomb. This one bomb right here uh, gave us enough uh, explosives to do about four months worth of uh, uh, charges. You're talking about 40, 50 year old bombs being reused again to destroy landmines. The munitions that were stockpiled and, and were meant for destruction are now being recycled and used to, for uh, humanitarian development. You're seeing parts of the documentary as we go through, and some of you might go, oh, OK, Blake's, Blake's made a film. I'm just a simple copper. I'm just a simple police officer. I knew nothing at all about making documentaries or making films when I started this. So it was a huge task, and a lot of people looked at me and went, you're crazy, you can't do it. But I'm, I'm fairly stubborn and I'm fairly tenacious, and through a lot of organising um, and a lot of learning on my part and a major chunk of my life savings, we began filming in 2012 in Vietnam, Cambodia, Thailand and Laos, and hopefully the documentary will be uh, shown in uh, early 2014. Now, the people you just saw up there on the screen are the Golden West Humanitarian Foundation. They harvest old unexploded bombs and use those explosives to destroy other unexploded bombs and other landmines. Now, it's recycling at its best, but it's not just recycling, it's visionary as well, because you're using something that is completely dangerous to destroy something else that's completely dangerous. Now, whilst filming the documentary, I was lucky enough to spend time with Golden West on the Tonley Sap River system, looking at some of their survey work and their search work, because a little known fact is that Cambodia's river systems are contaminated with unexploded ordnance. <coughs> correction, ordnance. During the conflict I mentioned earlier, the US sunk 200 ammunition barges in these rivers. And these ammunition barges contained everything from aircraft bombs, uh, artillery rounds, rocket propelled grenades, through to landmines. So this creates a major issue in that fishermen are pulling these things up in their nets and they're going off and they're either killing them or they're injuring them to an impoverished people who will go out and actively scavenge for them so they can get the metal for them to sell. Another major concern is that the extremist element, because these sites are unsecured, extremists can get access to these military-grade explosives, which is, a, which is a huge concern. To give you an idea, that's a map of the river systems in Cambodia. The green dots on the, uh, on the screen are the known locations of uh, sunken ammunition barges. The red dots are the approximate locations. And then, of course, there's the unknown locations where the Khmer Rouge or the Royal Cambodian Armed Forces or the Viet Cong have sunk barges that wasn't recorded on any statistical data. So to combat this, Golden West came up with the idea of formulating uh, a search uh, team to, to look for these barges. The problem being is that Cambodia doesn't have any unexploded ordnance recovery divers and it doesn't have any salvage divers. So Golden West formulated the idea to conduct training to recover these munitions and get rid of the problem that's there. And when I heard what they were trying to achieve with this diver course, I actively volunteered my time. So going back to where I started, in March this year, I spent six weeks in Cambodia on the inaugural Cambodian Underwater Explosive Recovery Dive Course. The course started with 38 students, and of interest was the fact that 70% couldn't swim. And when I say couldn't swim, they literally sunk like stones. <laughs> but over a period of six weeks, we took these students from not being able to swim 
to conducting open water dives to recover unexploded ordnance, all whilst completely blinded. At the completion of the course, there was 10 graduates and it's, it's envisaged that by the end of this year, they will conduct full salvage and survey work on the river systems there and start pulling the ordnance out of the river, making it safer. <laughs> now, I'd just like to say quickly, I conduct these activities in my own time at my own cost because I want to help. But you can also help. It's all about raising awareness. It's not about money. Speak to people, speak to your friends, speak to your family. Take that first step. Since I've taken that first step, I've met people who are courageous, they're resilient, and they're staring the massive issue in the eye and they're not backing down from it. It's changed my life an awful lot. Such a small thing with such huge consequences. One mind, one life. Thank you.